Often within the context of our faith journey, there are seasons where we have to reconsider what it is that's kind of clogging things up from allowing the Spirit of God to breathe in us. Are you tired? I would argue to give him nothing. Are you scattered? Give him your nothing. Are you anxious and frozen? It's tough to make decisions. Give him your nothing, because on the other side of your nothing, his breath brings hope of real abundant life. I found something out this week. Air conditioning companies, along with plumbers, are incredibly, uh, uh, just absolutely busy this, this season. This is their season. And I understand the HVAC guys. My brother's an HVAC guy. So, and there's a couple people who work with a couple HVAC companies. You don't see them over the summer because they're working overtime. But the plumbing thing I didn't get. But apparently, over the summer, plumbers are worth their weight in gold. And I know that because I'm about to share the most expensive illustration I have ever shared. This week, my plumbing backed up. Lord Jesus, I have learned more about the pipes in my house than I wanted, than I wanted to know. It started off fairly simple. I came home and uh, the, well, the bathroom downstairs seemed to be, I don't know, just not doing anything. It just seemed stagnant. And when I went to flush the bowl, of course, nothing happened. So there's that weird rush between where the level of the bowl rises and where you shut the water off. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Homeowners, make some noise. You know what I'm saying? You feel me? So I did everything I know to do Got the plunger out, started plunging, didn't work. Found my 13-year-old boys, blamed them. It had nothing to do with fixing the problem, but it made me feel better. Went to Home Depot, bought everything on the aisle, liquid stuff. Like I bought this thing that attached to my drill and supposed to go, I don't know what I'm doing. And then when all hope fails, I do what every strong man does, calls his dad. And his brother. And uh, within 20 minutes, they both came over and we started looking at stuff, trying to figure out. There's a couple, there's a couple symptoms I ignored. Symptom number one, my, my, the, 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 the sewage in my house started to like be slow. It was weird. Like flushing took an extra little bit of time. Water going down the drain took a little bit of extra time. The second symptom that I ignored was the backup. What I mean by that is I bought this fancy plunger and I started doing work. Wow, wow. you know, and, and, and at first you think it's an effort issue, so I want to make sure I'm giving it my best. I'm like heavy breathing, trying to get, I bought this new Fandango plunger that was invented by some NASA astronaut. I'm just trying to shove whatever down there. Like it didn't even matter at this point. I got my workout, filled my exercise ring just on plunging the toilet bowl. Only to realize that what was happening was all my effort was in vain because what was backing up now was actually all that water was moving into my bathtubs. Y'all feeling me? This is also the crappiest illustration I've ever shared. Come on, somebody! Listen, you better believe as I was writing the check, I'm like, dear Lord, you better use this for your glory. It was backing up. Here's the third symptom that I ignored. The third symptom was that ultimately all of the things I knew to do weren't working. All of the things I knew to do weren't working. So when my brother came over, we opened up release files. It was like fountains of living water flowing from my home. I have no idea how to explain that except that. Um, and then finally, when we got all the way, we traced all that we could. We realized that it was beyond our understanding. So we called upon Steve, the plumber. <laughs> called Steve that night. Uh, Steve said, hey, I can't make it there till 7.45 in the morning. So Jess and I went through a season of prayer and fasting. Uh, <laughs> Just because that meant nobody could use the restroom in the house. And I had, again, two 13-year-old boys, a wife, and my mother-in-law staying with us. So, yeah, it was uh, not, not a lot of sleep that night. And um, woke up in the morning to Steve knocking at my door at 7.30. Steve was there nice and early. Steve examined the house, went back to his truck, took about four minutes and came out. And he said, well, I mean, you did everything to know to do. The problem isn't the pipes in your house. The problem is there's this one pipe between your house and the city water line. 
that seems to have been corroded. There's a root growing in. He, he laid this all out. What, what Steve reminded me was, although my house is 100 plus years old, the plumbing system is relatively new. And everything in my house was right, except for that point where it connected to the source of the sewer. There are moments in our lives where we've ignored the symptoms long enough and we can try with all human effort to kind of resolve that thing only to find that at the core, there's something at the foundation of it all that's wrong. So what I want to do this morning is step back to our beginning, to our foundation, where it all started. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. See, I told you right at the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 reads like this. Then the Lord formed the man from dust out of the ground, and he breathed. Someone say breathe. Breathe, breathe into his nostril the breath of life. Then man became a living being. I submit to you this morning that when dealing with those blockages of life, one of the things we have to remember is that God, he breathes into nothing. He breathes into nothing. Notice in our origin stories, the material by which God uses to form is dust. How much would you spend for 150 pounds worth of dust? Not much. Notice he uses the phrase dust and not dirt. The difference between dust and dirt is at least in dirt there's nutrients, but with dust there's nothing. Notice that the nuance of dust is it's tough to put together. He doesn't say clay, although he uses that metaphor later. When talking about us at our origin points, you sense, and I, I know that you do, you sense that idea that without God, there is that nothing, that disconnection, that spread, sporadic. There's no form, there's no function, there's no purpose. It's simply just dust. But in the beginning of our story, what we read is where there is no destiny, where there is no worth, where there's no reason, where there is no purpose, he breathes. There's a popular notion that says, John, I mean, I would come to the Lord, but the problem is I have nothing to offer him. I would argue that maybe it's your nothing that he's waiting for. That when we create space within the context of our nothing, he's able to breathe into what is shattered and distant and disconnected, and he breathes life. Psalms chapter 33, verse 6 says it this way, the Lord merely spoke, and the heavens were created. I don't know why the psalmist uses a different tactic here, but when it comes to the creation of the heavens, he doesn't even mention an origin material. He didn't say that God took dust and made it into stars. No, no, he just said he spoke, that he breathed the words and the stars were born. That at the simple mention of light, planets were formed. The sun was placed exactly where it needs to be placed. The more that I study science, the more I understand the glory of a God who through simple words breathes life. In your nothing, I believe the creative process, the blank canvas that God is looking for is necessary in order for his spirit to bring life in and through us. So the question is, have you allowed him to breathe into that nothing? Well, here's maybe a symptom from my sewage issue that may help you ponder this question. Are things just a little slow? Is the rhythm of life getting you to a point right now where you just sense this slowing down, this mucking up? Often within the context of our faith journey, there are seasons where we have to reconsider what it is that's kind of clogging things up from allowing the Spirit of God to breathe in us. Are you tired? I would argue to give him nothing. Are you scattered? Give him your nothing. Are you anxious and frozen? It's tough to make decisions. Give him your nothing, because on the other side of your nothing, his breath brings hope of real, abundant life. Allow him to breathe in you. 
Not only does he breathe into nothing, I also believe he breathes into what's dead. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 5 is this infamous story. I've always loved this story where God brings a prophet to a valley of dry bones. You guys ever read this story before? This is an incredible picture. And the objective in, in this whole story of, of, of dry bones at that moment, God by his spirit it, it speaks to the, to the prophet and says, hey, do you think that these bones can come to life again? And the prophet being a Sunday school attending young man decides to answer with a Sunday school answer. He's like, well, God, you're God. You can do whatever you want. What do you say of these bones? And I love it because the answer that God gives in return is found here in verse five. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I, I, listen, I, I, I believe that in this moment, what God is not just defining is the spiritual condition of the children of God. I believe for many of us, we have seen what it's like to dwell among a people of dry bones. If there's, a, if there's a cultural picture of where we live in 2024, when it comes to people's spiritual journeys, for so many people, they are navigating this life of dry bones. That relation, that, that, that co-worker that you know is in that, that, that insidious relationship or, or, or that neighbor that you know that's, that's cheating on his finances and creating all kind of immoral choices that often what we're surrounded with is this question, do you believe that they can live again? I believe for so many of you who may be surrounded in workplaces, surrounded in relationships, surrounded in communities where there's death all around you, that the Spirit of God is maybe asking that same question, do you believe that they can live again? Maybe even within the personal context of your soul, there's been so much death around you. There's been so much death within you because of some separation between you and the Father that the Spirit of God this morning is asking you the question, do you believe that your dry bones can live again? And the answer to that question, of course, through the, 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 the beautiful words found here in Ezekiel is that he says, I will make my breath enter you and you will come to life again. Listen, this is quite honestly the, the truth of the gospel. Paul is trying to explain this to the church. Uh, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says it this way, my old self has been crucified with Christ. What he's saying in this passage is that old self that creates death. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the book of Romans. But it also says that the penalty of that sin is death. So I just need you to hear that often, unless there is a connection with the living God, that by the product of his absence, you and I only deserve that. Sin is not something that I actively choose to participate in, although you can actively choose to participate in. But without Jesus, if you have not handled that sin within you with the life and sacrifice of Jesus, I just need you to know that death is the only outcome. You know, as I was uh, plunging that toilet with the NASA design plunger, um, what ended up happening was there was so much pressure in the system that there was nowhere for the water to escape. So then it began to back up into the bathtubs in my home. Death has this way of permeating outside even the scope of your own life and begins to affect those who are around you. Death has this way, it has this way of showing up through the pores of our systems bringing death to relationships, bringing death in conversations that everything out of my mouth is death. Everything, every product of my hand seems to be pointing towards death. That death shows up. The question, once again, that God poses to the prophet is, do you believe these bones can live again? And the answer that I bring you this morning is yes. When we allow the Spirit of God to breathe into what's dead, dead things come alive. But the reason that the writer here in Galatians is so specific, he's talking about himself. He's saying, I have to choose to allow the death in me to be crucified with Christ. That cardinal flesh that shows up from time to time, that, that thing that we all have to navigate, we have to choose to die to that thing in order that Christ, it goes on to say, uh, uh, it is I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You know, often when it comes to our relationship with God, we treat it as this additive. Um, I am Puerto Rican. Um, 
by, by birth. Um, what did you say that was? My culture, not my nationality. I don't know. It's confusing. I'm Puerto Rican. Um, I'm Puerto Rican, and I don't speak Spanish, so that makes me a bad Puerto Rican. And <laughs> it does. It just does. I've learned that my whole life. It's always awkward when I'm in uh, missions trips in South America and the missionary looks over me, it's your time to preach. It's like, that's great. Where's my translator? <laughs> um, baño, agua. That's all I got. That's all, that's all, that's all I got. Um, one of the marks of my Puerto Rican ship, uh, though, that I make up for is I love Puerto Rican food. Um, yes, come on, somebody. Mm. Some, some pork chops. Um, and, and one of the reasons I love Puerto Rican uh, food so much is this secret ingredient. And I know some of my, my uh, Caucasian brothers have figured this out. Secret ingredient is called adobo. Adobo. Does anybody, if you've ever had adobo on anything, make a little noise. It's changed you, I know. That's right. Some sofrito, too. I mean, that's, we didn't want to get too crazy. Uh, <laughs> The difference between adobo and sofrito, though, is that you can put adobo in a lot of, uh, sofrito in a lot of stuff. You can put adobo on everything. <laughs> it started off just with, like, chuletas or, I'm sorry, pork chops, or you put a little adobo on meats and a little adobo on the right. You know, you just put it on, on some stuff. But then you get a little crazy, and you start throwing it on everything. You throw it on hot dogs. You throw it on hamburgers. <laughs> you throw adobo on a popsicle. I don't, it don't even matter. It don't even matter. Love additives. It makes what I'm doing taste Good. When it comes to our relationship with God, I feel like what we have done culturally is he is now an additive. And what we're asking him to do is to make sweet some things that quite honestly should be sour. We're asking him to bless this thing. Now, now hear me, I, I'm all about blessing. And, and please continue to pray that God would bless. I love that, I love that. And yet, there is this nuance. God bless this job. God bless these, this, 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 this career decision. God bless our finances. God bless my health. Like all those things are great. And yet, there's a nuance that Paul would argue that turns around and says, no, no, what is it that God is blessing? And how do I die to myself and live fully in what God is asking me to live in? That there's a little bit of a difference, and I want to make sure that you catch this, because for so many of you, your relationship with God, because of the nature of culture, you kind of add on to your current journey. And Paul is saying, no, first I die to my journey. John Hernandez no longer lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. I come alive to his journey. Notice that it's in those moments that I die to myself, that he breathes life in us. God is looking for those who are dead to breathe in, dead to sin, dead to pride, dead to those evil desires, that what is dead comes to life. Um, several years ago, as a collective staff, we had a gathering um, to just hang out. And um, we were with a couple other pastors, and there was this pool that we were middle of the summer, so we were all jumping in the water, having a good time. And then we went and ate, and afterwards we were hanging out, and unfortunately, someone just didn't have eyes in the pool the whole time, and one of the children jumped in, and uh, nobody caught it, and by the time we pulled him out the water, he was blue. Uh, just a moment. Um, those who were equipped for it quickly stepped in. Uh, actually, uh, Phil was one of those people, trained uh, in CPR, began actively doing mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, trying to resuscitate the boy. And the rest of us, as children of God, did what we know to do in those moments. We just started praying. Uh, there's a different type of prayer when death is around. It's just, I know that there's some of you hear me, that you pray in your head or you pray really quiet. I'm not. I'm not knocking that, like, amen, just as long as you're praying. But when death's around, prayer tends to get a little aggressive. And I remember, like, between some of the family members who were just praying at the top of their lungs and us as a team just praying and other people directing traffic, making sure that uh, they were on the phone with the EMTs. And there was a moment where that little boy who was blue caught a breath of air. And all that was clogged up in him came out. 
and what was blue and lifeless came back to life as breath filled his lungs. I, I, I just sense like that's something God wants to do in this room this morning. And some of you have walked in here just choked up and blue with the nonsense of the world, the nonsense of your week, a disconnection from a real relationship with the Spirit of God, and you're asking, John, what do I do? Hear me. Hand him your death and watch him breathe life in you. Watch him breathe life in you. There's life on the other side. And then, thirdly, John chapter 20, verse 21. John chapter 20, verse 21, it reads like this. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So let me catch you up in the story. Jesus had died, crucified, cross, very public, pulled off the cross, stuck into a grave. Three days later, shows back up. I know that we have normalized this. Amen. We've read our Bible enough, Pastor John. I just need you to know to those disciples, this was crazy. Matter of fact, after the death of Jesus, what we find the disciples doing is they don't know what to do with themselves, so they go back to what they've always done, and Jesus finds them on a fishing boat. Just kind of want to rewind you to where Jesus found them originally. He was found them at the side of a fishing boat where he told them, come with me and I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus dies and they question what Jesus told them at the beginning. We can make fun of the disciples all we want, but how many times did we hear God say something, an issue shows up, we find ourselves separated, and once again we are questioning what God said at the beginning. So here are the disciples trying to figure out what they're going to do next. Jesus shows up. Hey, guys. What? <laughs> he not only shows up to them, but he shows up to hundreds of people. We, we know this not just from Scripture, but historical evidence that Jesus shows up physically. He shows up physically. He hits them with this, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. <laughs> and he breathed on them. I'm just saying, sounds a little weird. The reason for the breath is that he quickly turns and says, receive the Holy Spirit in this moment. What we believe God is doing is he is breathing his spirit into what's normal. Just, they're ordinary. Um, it, it, was a, it was a tough season for them. The, the person who they had rallied around, who had called them to life, who had instilled in them purpose, well, he was gone. They didn't know what to do. They were in a dark season. Matter of fact, Judas ends up taking his own life. The season was so dark. Psalms chapter 139 verse 8 gives us insight to how God is present in dark seasons. It says, if I go... Up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Someone needs to highlight this in your Bible because sometimes your, your, your anxiety has you believing that you're all alone. And I just need you to know, I'm not telling you it's not dark, but I am telling you he's not absent. I'm not telling you it's not scary, but I am telling you he's there. I, I'm, I'm not telling you that there's reason for being frozen in indecision. But the God who created the universe, his proximity only moves closer. Jesus was willing to meet them, um, pull them out of their dark place. And then Acts chapter 1, verse 80 explains this whole Holy Spirit thing. He said this, but you will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes on you. I want to pause it for a moment because, again, I don't hear me, hear this pastor's heart when I say this. I don't say this in condemnation. This is just an observation. I feel like collectively we live in a weak culture right now. All I mean by that is everybody's afraid to take strong steps. I don't want to offend anyone. I'm afraid if I take this step, no one's gonna, there's not going to be any grace if it's the wrong step. I'm afraid of saying anything because if I say stuff, maybe people will see it in the wrong light. 
I'm afraid of this career choice because what happens if this career choice doesn't work out? I'm, I'm afraid of making a commitment. I'm not looking, I'm not looking at anyone in this room. So I look at, there's no pretense in my head for anyone in this room. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that they're the one, and I'm afraid that if I make this decision, I'm afraid if I make this decision, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin everything. So I'd rather live in sin than deal with divorce. I just feel like within the context of culture right now where we're living is this place where everyone's afraid to walk and take strong steps. And yet what I read in this passage is that the Spirit of God came that we would have power, but I want you to read the wholeness of this passage to understand the why of the power. It's not power to do the thing that I want God to do for me. That's additive. He says it really clearly. He says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. The power is channeled within us by the Spirit of God breathing into our weakness. He empowers us that we would be witnesses. One of the reasons that we struggle with weakness is we have not connected our weakness or or who we are to his purpose. We walk in weakness because God is not gonna empower you to do that thing. I'm sorry. That thing that's in the back of your head that you know is you, that's built of flesh and pride and ego. I just need you to know God is not interested in empowering you for his, with his Holy Spirit to do that thing that's self-glorifying, that's all about you, that's been birthed in the, 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 the pits of hell. There, there are so many times that in, even in conversations with people that are like, I'm weak. Yes, because your purpose does not glorify God. But when your purpose is connected to the cross, there is power. There is power to step into what's normal and empower you to do the supernatural, to be his witnesses to Judea, Samaria, in the ends of the wor- uh, ends of the earth. There's a, there is a destiny that God is calling you to. There is a hope that God is calling you to there. And, and in that, there is need for power and it's spirit that breathes into what's normal and equips us to do the supernatural, to do more than what's normal. You know, uh, I had a conversation with someone recently. And in their kind of journey of the faith, they're at this point where um, they're trying to figure out their calling. There's a difference between calling and purpose. We all share the same purpose. Uh, you know, the scripture is really clear. Go into all the world, make disciples. Like, that, that's, all, that's all of our purpose, right? To glorify God, to expand the kingdom of God. The calling, how we accomplish that is unique to who we are and it's also unique to seasons. There's some seasons where we're called to one thing and then God moves and shifts and wires us differently and we're, we're, called, we're called to another thing. So there's difference between uh, our purpose and our calling. Is everybody with me? But within the context of the conversation, it sensed like there was a seeming like he only felt like the only way that he could accomplish what God has asked him to do his purpose was that he moved into a full-time occupational ministry. Hear me, I love full-time occupational ministry. This is what I've done since I was 21 years old and I am not 21 no more, it's been a long time. I love not just God's calling on my life, but working with other young ministers in seasons of calling and helping them fully define that. But I just need you to know, Not all of us in this room are called to full-time occupational ministry. That would be crazy. Not only would it be crazy, because, I mean, that'd be nuts. But but then again, consider the influence of the church. How in the world will this institution that I believe has been laid out by the hand of God, how in the world is that institution going to affect the city if everyone in that that institution is focused on full-time occupational ministry? No, God God in his sovereignty saw that there would be some of you that are doctors, lawyers, that are working within the context of finances, that are moms, that are that that are are, uh, attend PTA groups, that 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 are part of your community's uh, 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 HOA system. I don't know, that, 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 that hang out, that know that your circle of influence is not my circle of influence, what would it look like if the church became obsessed with this idea that God has empowered us to expand his kingdom into the circles of influence that he's called us into? 
that somehow where you are is exactly where you need to be, connected to his purpose to live a life of power that showcases the hope and purpose of Jesus right where you're at. You want to ask me how a city has changed? When a church decides that it's not just about the ministers, but each and every one of us carry the power of the Spirit to bring change. Change in our community groups. Change at parks. Change around coffee tables. Change around living rooms that we, inspired by the Spirit of God, do the work of the kingdom. Why are we weak? Because we're disconnected from the purpose. But when we are, the Spirit of God breathes into what's natural, and it's there that he does the supernatural. I didn't get permission to share this story. Um, but I'm going to share it anyway and ask for forgiveness later. But one of our very own just had a, a child and uh, Pastor Ashley was hanging out with them uh, in the hospital. And uh, one of the nurses who had been kind of eavesdrop, eavesdropping on the conversation turned around and said, hey, well, I'm new to the area. I've been looking for a church. And that mom, brand new mom, turns around and rips a piece of the paperwork off and starts writing down her information and the information for the church. Yes. I know it seems simple. And yet, my argument would be for that nurse, who is bringing the power? For your coworkers, we can complain. It's easy. They're a bunch of hellions. <laughs> crazy, they come in on Monday and the, the, the stink of their weekends all on them. Yeah, that's death. That's how death works. Can I ask you a question? Do you think those dry bones can live again? Yeah. What would it look like for a church collective to allow the Spirit of God to breathe in us, connected to His purpose? We see the power of God come alive in each and every one of us. Second Timothy says it like this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Move down with me to verse 9. It says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan from the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. That when we allow him to, he breathes into what's natural, and we're able to do the supernatural. You know, I always try to figure out how to close these messages because they're challenging. Um, and if you think they're challenging for you, try living with it all week long. <laughs> Your boy's always stepping on his own toes. It's the weirdest thing, but uh, it's how the Spirit of God works. But one of the questions is always... How do, we, how do we respond to a message of, of this magnitude? And I, I, th I do think there's three general questions. Um, and the first one is probably the most important. Is, is there death in you? Um, is there death in you? If, if you're in this room, you're like, John, I don't know how I know. Well, the stench of death seems to permeate. It's one of, it's one of those things that, like it comes out of your pores like you've been wrestling with death all week you know it I don't have to try to convince you of it I just want to make sure that you're aware that you don't have to that Christ came and he lived the perfect life paid a penalty we could not pay died and raised on the third day in order that you and I could find life and find it to the fullest you don't have to live in that death no more you just have to allow him to breathe into that death you carry. And with your head bowed and eye closed all across the room, if that's you, I would love to pray with you. I would love for this to be the moment of, of transformation where you give a chance for his spirit to breathe into you. The scripture is clear when we confess with our mouth and believe with our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. That not only he can save us, but he's worthy of laying our lives down for that it's at that moment that we experience salvation. That means the Spirit of God steps within us and we become alive again. Even driving in this morning, I felt like the Spirit of God was asking that question. Do you believe those dry bones can live again? If you're here and that's you, whether it's your first time ever responding to something like this, or maybe you say yes to Jesus 
uh, 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 you know, when you were 16, year old, 16 years old at a youth camp, but you have found yourself separated, disconnected. What a moment to come back home. And I would love, again, to pray with you in the quiet of this moment. I'm simply going to ask you to put the hand on your heart as a sign between you and God. I'll see it. It'll allow me to pray for you, but a sign between you and the Father that this would be that moment of transformation in you. Even now, I'm looking around the room. That's me, Pastor John. Remember me in prayer. I want to be made alive. Yeah, yeah. Father, for every hand on every heart, for those who are watching online, maybe sitting in a, in a coffee shop, Lord, even now, I just pray that you would breathe by your spirit, that as we confess you as Lord and Savior, that the only way to the Father is by you. And that we, Lord, as sinners are wrong, we are in need of a Savior. That, that, Lord, your Spirit would come in. Lord, that it would breathe fresh life into us for every hand on every heart in this moment. I just pray that they would experience you fresh and anew. That your Spirit, again, would breathe into what's dead and they would come alive in you, God. That be a different walk, Lord, even as they leave this morning. That they'd be a different attitude, a different shift mindset. You said that we are transformed formed by the renewing of our mind and I pray that their minds would be renewed even now that you would surround them with men and women of the faith that would help them in the next step of this journey that Lord as you work through and in them God we would all sit back in amazement of what you have done yes these dry bones can live again God and we'll give you glory and the honor for it Lord. we'll give you glory and the honor for it and I said there was three ways of responding to this message. I'm going to ask everyone to stand right where you are. The, the second question that I have is maybe there's been some need for the supernatural in your life. Like you keep all the human effort in the world. You're just trying You feel like you're running your head up against the wall. You need a touch of the Spirit to do what only He can do, if that's you. I'd love to pray with you also. And in the same way, as you're standing with your head bowed and eye closed, simply put a hand on your heart as a sign between you and the Father. That's me. That's where I'm at. I need the Spirit of God to breathe in me. I need to take what's normal and make it supernatural. I need supernatural grace for my kids. I need supernatural peace for my coworkers. I need supernatural wisdom to deal with these finances. God, for every hand on every heart, I pray that you would come in by your power, that you would breathe fresh upon us, God. We depend on you in this moment to fill us to overflow, God. Fill us to overflow. Take what's normal. Make it your own, God, that we would be empowered by your spirit to accomplish your purpose for your name's sake God we pray for your name's sake that you would breathe in us God in what's normal and ordinary and we would see you do the supernatural and the extraordinary God and we'll give you the glory and the honor and the last response to this message is simple if you need the breath of God to breathe fresh in you would you just lift both hands to heaven as we sing this together it's your breath in our lungs Father it's your breath in our lungs I pray that you would fill us by your spirit God that we would be free in our worship free to celebrate all that you're doing and we'll give you the glory and the honor we'll give you the glory and the honor so we pray